Okay, thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. We're really thrilled to see familiar faces and new ones. Uh, my name's Mary Ruckelshaus, and I'm the managing director of the Natural Capital Project, so I'll be our moderator for a little bit of discussion with our panelists, but we also would really in, um, encourage engagement with all of you. So my background is uh, I fell in love with nature and science, um, scuba diving in the cold Pacific Northwest of the United States. And I worked for an academic institution for a long time doing research, but I think my formative years in my career so far were when I worked with the US government. I was with the Commerce Department in NOAA, and that's where I really fell in love with having science informed decisions and thinking about what were the actors out in the world, in the public and private sector, really thinking about what was their framing for how they would take up the ecosystem and science things I cared a lot about. So when I joined NatCap um, almost 12 years ago, I was thrilled because this is what NatCap does. So what we are is a really um, wonderful partnership working with lots of really smart young people and decision makers around the world. And our whole aim is to help people take the values of nature into their decisions. So I imagine everyone in this room has, since we've been little, a really good intuitive feel for how nature benefits people. It feeds us, it gives us clean water, it, it fills our souls spiritually, so many different ways. So we kind of know that, and people around the world that we meet know this very instinctually. But if you want to try to take that, that sort of intuitive knowledge and make it change decisions, you need more than just a feeling. So what the Natural Capital Project does, and we've been doing this for 12 years now, is take those values of nature and work with the people who want to take them up into their decisions and help them quantify them and spatially represent them in metrics that move decisions. And that's really done with and for the decision makers who are going to take it up. So it's a really great way to do our three kind of pillars of our approach. And it's science, technology, and partnership. So that's how we work. And we're training people in universities and research institutions to do cutting edge science, but really with and for the end users of that science. So get this latest, greatest information on how to value nature out into practice and test it much more readily than might happen in a, in a conventional academic setting where you publish a paper and hope somebody reads it and takes it up. So that's our real approach. And we really do a lot of science, as I mentioned, and then through technology with this open source platform with our data and model, software models. So that we're developing a language that's standard language that people can use anywhere in the world that's repeatable and transparent. And people in a network of about 300 institutions now that are part of our partnership are taking that information and improving it and incorporating lessons they're learning into it. And then we share it through our software platform itself, but also through lots of convenings and trainings around the world to, to build capacity. And in, in places like this where we meet with smart people and have discussions. So we're really looking forward to this. So thanks again for coming. And I'd like to introduce the three panel members. And then we'll go through a few rounds of questions here. And then we'll open it up for discussion with you. So to my immediate right is Gretchen Daly. And Gretchen is a professor in biology at Stanford and also the, a co-founder of the Natural Capital Project. So she is the intellectual driver and heart and soul of NatCap, and you'll hear more from her. And then next to her is Alvaro Umania, who is a senior research fellow at Katia, which is a tropical research um, and higher education center in Costa Rica. He's the former environment and energy minister in Costa Rica and has, will tell us much more about his policy experience, which is extensive both in Costa Rica and around the world. And he's a, a dear friend to NatCap from the beginning. 
And then on my far right is Lisa Mandel, who is a lead scientist of NatCap and a quantitative ecologist and who's really been spearheading a lot of our infrastructure work. So with that, I will turn it over to Lisa, who will give us a little brief precy on this book that she's just edited. Great. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, so as Mary said, I'm Lisa Mandel. I'm a lead scientist uh, with the Natural Capital Project and have been with NatCap for uh, now more than seven years, which is hard to believe. Um, and I, I had a long interest in the connection between people and nature and the environment, um, and this was really um, especially deepened during my time as a graduate student in Hawaii and working in, in rural South India. Um, and then, then went on to join NatCap where I've been doing a lot of work around infrastructure planning and development and accounting for the values of nature in that. And then also um, with a focus on um, making sure that in our work we capture the, the inclusive part of inclusive green growth. So understanding um, who, who benefits and how these approaches can um, provide more inclusive benefits to, to people. Um, I thought I'd start maybe with a little bit of a story about how the book came to be, um, and then tell you a little bit more about what's, what's in it. So at the Natural Capital Project, we often give workshops and trainings around the world um, how to, about how to use our approaches and tools to understand um, and map and quantify the different benefits from nature. And um, one of the questions that I had been hearing a lot at our workshops was, okay, now that we have a better understanding and a better ability to represent these values of nature, how do we turn that information and that knowledge into action um, in the many places people were working around the world? And NatCap has some great success stories that we were able to share, but there wasn't really uh, one resource that I felt like I could point people to to show the, the breadth of ways um, around the world that these approaches really have been implemented. Um, and so you know, a few years later, we were working um, with the support of the Paulson Institute, who I can't thank enough for making this, this book happen. Um, and I realized that the, um, the different policy and finance mechanisms that we were putting together in that work really, um, I think, had a wider audience um, and would be really beneficial. It was information I wish I had um, earlier on and really wanted to be able to share. Um, so with the work of over 70 contributors, um, some of whom are in this room right now, we, um, we put together um, this book, which is called Green Growth That Works natural capital policy and finance mechanisms around the world. Um, and it has, it has three main parts. The first part is, uh, describes sort of where we are now. And then um, I think I can say this because I didn't write any of these <laughs> chapters. It has a series of really inspiring chapters of how, about how different pathways to scale these approaches um, beyond the individual pilots or kind of bespoke approaches that have been developed in so many creative ways. Um, and then the second section, focuses on a set of six different um, mechanisms that have been really commonly used in different ways and provides practical uh, case studies from many different contexts, um, diving into some of the, the details, um, but in a very practical way of, of how these approaches were implemented um, and sort of how the different pieces come together to lead to change on the ground. And then the final section um, is a series of place-based examples. So, everywhere from, from Costa Rica to China to the coastal US of how different mechanisms have been combined um, into to broader systems to secure and enhance the benefits from nature. Um, and so, yeah, the Natural Capital Project, um, we really focus on science for decision making. And I think this book shows how that science can come together with um, governance and legal systems and economics um, to lead to practical approaches for um, changing actions. So thanks, Lisa. So Alvaro, can you tell us the, the arc of the story about how Costa Rica, which is really one of the, the, the sort of sources of all of this innovation and in natural capital getting taken up in decisions, can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yes, well, um, I was trained at Stanford in environmental engineering and economics, basically a water uh, guy. And when I went back to Costa Rica, I had a hard realization that the real problem at the moment was deforestation. And that was what people were focused on. 
so I uh, told uh, President Arias when he was in his campaign that we should try to have a Ministry of Energy and Environment. Uh, because in Costa Rica, most of our energy comes from our forest in, in the form of hydropower and water. Um, and the problem that we had, it was that, you know, the, the forest had no value. Standing trees, living trees have zero value. Only dead trees had value. Uh, and, and this is a very important realization to have, is how, how do we provide value for a living tree uh, so that people will not cut it? Uh, we had at the time a program of reforestation. And um, it was a, a, a big mistake because people could deduct uh, the, from their taxes uh, the hectares that were planted, but the middlemen kept the land and the, the wood. Uh, all you bought was the right to deduct. Uh, so once people deducted the taxes, they didn't care if the forest grew or not. Uh, so we decided that we needed to completely change the system and focus on small landholders and provide them uh, with resources so that first they could replant and second, primarily and most important, take care of the existing forest. And with debt swaps, um, some for conservation, like in the case of Sweden and others, uh, for forestry, like in the case of the Netherlands, uh, we started to change the system of incentives that eventually led for the payment for ecosystem services. Um, this has you know, worked for about 12% of Costa Rica. Uh, another 12% is, is in national parks. Uh, so from a low of below 30% forest cover, now we have made the turnaround and we are at, at about 54% forest cover and gaining. Of course, uh, we'll not be able to reach more than 60, 65% because uh, there are many other uses, agricultural cities, etc. cetera. And, uh, and although we have made a great stride uh, with the payment for ecosystem services that originally covered four services, carbon sequestration, water production, uh, biodiversity, and scenic beauty. And we've been able to implement carbon sequestration, uh, water production, and biodiversity. Uh, but the problem is that this program is paid primarily by a fuel tax of 3.5% that goes directly to forest uh, investments. Uh, and, that, and for every 10 people who apply to this program, only three can make it. And the reason is that there's not enough, uh, there's not enough funds uh, to, to go around for everybody. But, but what Costa Rica has proven is that it's possible to reverse deforestation, to change the, the system of incentives. Uh, and uh, people don't get paid very much. Uh, it, it, it's on the order of 20 to $30 an acre per year to preserve the forest. Uh, but this is sufficient to cause many people to go for conservation. Uh, our main problems now d don't deal so much with loss of forest, but forest fires, and we have done a lot of strides in forest fires, and also reducing the footprint of agriculture, uh, which is very heavy. We have a lot of coffee, uh, now pineapple, uh, palm oil, uh, and these are eating into the forest and have a, a very heavy footprint. So by no means, have we solved the problem, but we have shown the way, and many countries, about 80 or 90 countries have come to Costa Rica, uh, including China. A long time ago, they sent a delegation of, of the People's Congress to, to look at this program, and uh, I think that we have, may have had some success in trying to spread it to other areas. Thank you very much.
Alvaro, thank you. So picking up on his last point, Gretchen, can you talk about what you're seeing in terms of how we're moving China. From, this, from this single cases to many places around the world? Yeah, it's great. Everybody's <clears throat> introducing themselves a bit. I, I'll do so too. I grew up with my dad in the US military, and we were based um, in West Germany through the end of my high school. And then I came to Stanford, and um, I'd say in West Germany, I saw mainly the problems. Acid rain became a massive issue, and there was a lot of forest dieback, which was really dramatic in economic, political, because the pollution's being transported all over, and also cultural terms. Just a lot of people in Central Europe go out walking in the forest each weekend, and you really don't feel like walking through one of these um, completely dead uh, regions. So <clears throat> coming to the US and to Stanford, and, and then um, eventually as a grad student getting to Costa Rica, I'd say I came to this field falling in love with Alvaro <laughs> and with Costa Rica. I was really lucky to uh, arrive. <clears throat> this was 1991. Uh, when I was super young, and um, it was incredible to hear, first of all, about, I mean, the dramatic problems. Costa Rica was the poster child for planetary destruction, the little country that it is, but <clears throat> the forests um, being wiped out at the highest rate at a national scale of anywhere in the world. And, and then to see it turn around, it was incredible, and to actually meet. Um, people like Alvaro in the ministry and even President Arias back then and to see them share in the Nobel Peace Prize for um, so many good things that they brought <clears throat> peace among people and between people and nature and um, so ever since then I've been really keen to help advance as Alvaro said the um, the possibility of replicating in some sense, adapting and replicating models of success um, with Costa Rica, my main inspiration then. And um, I'm gonna jump now to the case Alvaro just touched on, country that couldn't be more different from Costa Rica in just about every respect, China, though, um, it was amazing. At the time, it was 97, roughly, when Costa Rica implemented this, the world's first ever you know, nationwide payment system to value and um, give credit to people protecting and restoring trees, um, living trees. And China started <clears throat> the same type of program at an incredible scale a couple years later. In 1998, they had the worst flooding in human history, and um, it was determined that it was upstream deforestation on the Yangtze River that really exacerbated the flood risk that is innate in a <clears throat> monsoonal rain system like they experienced. But uh, it was heavy deforestation that led to, you know, the worst flooding ever billions of dollars in damages. Swiss Ray estimated the damages in the 35 billion range, tens of millions of people you know, affected. And um, that led China to implement the largest system overnight. Guess how many people enrolled in this payment for ecosystem services program? It was um, like in Costa Rica, focused on the small holders um, of land and, you know, incentivizing basically reforestation in most places, sometimes reversion to grassland, but anything but the annual cropping, which is so subject to erosion and can't hold heavy rains when they come. So 120 million households enrolled basically overnight, and China now has the highest rate of reforestation anywhere. It's not without problems, but it's um, really inspiring to see. And just taking another minute, um, I'll scroll ahead. There are many initiatives in China now since roughly you know, 2000 when this program got launched. 
that aim um, <clears throat> now in a pretty high profile and incredibly systematic and um, comprehensive set of policies that aim to achieve an ecological civilization for the 21st century. And it might sound like madness knowing and for anybody who's been in China having tasted sort of the extremes of environmental degradation and poisoning of the air and water and land, the soil and so many other environment related problems taken to an extreme. Yet the government now is, <clears throat> is going kind of beyond any other country in trying to address them. And one of the things that really stands out is um, an effort to transform the financial system. Like Alvaro was saying, Lisa, everybody, you know, to be green and inclusive. And one um, dimension of this is they're developing to go alongside GDP, a new metric where GDP reports on economic per performance, GEP, Gross Ecosystem Product, has been designed. We're working closely with them and providing much of the science and the software to calculate GEP, the total value of the goods and services produced by ecosystems in an area over, say, a year. And it can be applied at any scale. It's being applied in China at the national scale. But importantly for implementation at the provincial, the municipality, and the county scales. So just like economies are really complex, we got tons of goods and services coming out. This is a complex thing they're trying to do. And we're just at the earliest stages of making it meaningful and robust and effective. But the idea is to, using our software to, um, well, first just go out using satellites and um, a lot of other approaches on the ground, measure and constantly report the condition of ecosystem assets in, in the country. Any country could do this. And China and road testing all of this technology is paving the way for the world to adopt similar approaches. Um, and then with the software that's universally available, quantifying the stream of benefits that comes from the ecological assets in a country. Um, and then this is being used to do basically three things. You know, one is to reveal to people the value of ecosystems to society. Um, and the second is to inform financial compensation so that especially what the people that typically are more poor, more vulnerable, yet that hold the assets, uh, that are stewards of these assets, that they are compensated for this stewardship and incentivized and enabled to do a better job and restore ecosystems. So right now, 200 million people as part of their day-to-day livelihood are being paid to restore ecosystems across the country. And the software helps pinpoint where to make those investments for the highest return uh, for water security for cities, for carbon storage and sequestration, climate security, coastal climate resilience, for flood control and other things. Biodiversity is a huge part of it. And then finally, this is being reported very visibly and many uh, governments at the provincial, municipal, and um, county levels are being held only to GEP, not to GDP anymore, in terms of their performance. So that's one case of many um, <clears throat> where, uh, partly through Costa Rica's inspiration, we're seeing much wider adoption at scale of these kinds of advances and innovations. Great, thanks Gretchen. And the, the really nice thing about these cases that have been building over the years around the world is that they're now really, we're starting to see them scale. So we spent yesterday we're with the World Bank and they're taking essentially the GEP type approach that Gretchen just mentioned and we're developing with them a natural capital index that will be reported for every country in the world. Um, as a way to start to get these good ideas to spread 
and there will be continuing innovation with countries in how they apply it. They'll watch China closely, but they'll innovate on their own, learning from Costa Rica and other places. But one great thing, Lisa, I'd love you to chat a little bit about working with development banks, and in most countries, the, the people side and the connecting na nature to people is really at the heart of where people enter this discussion with us. It's not just from biodiversity conservation, but it's really on how can we lift people out of poverty or provide better health. Can you talk about, we talk a lot in this book about inclusive green growth. Can you talk about what that means to you? Um, so I guess to think about inclusive green growth, I'll start with I guess, the idea of, of green growth, um, which to me is the idea that we can, we can improve, and indeed it's an essential part of improving human well-being, is um, securing and enhancing the natural capital um, on which our individuals' livelihoods and economies um, and personal well-being depends. So everything from um, protecting coastlines from storms to clean water, um, to, yeah, places to go out and be in nature and recharge um, and get the many mental and physical health benefits that we're just starting to understand. Um, but it's not just enough to think about the total amount of benefits that are produced, the total amount of carbon stored, or um, the total amount of mangroves protected, but really understanding the, the people part. And the, to me, the inclusive part is, is um, being deliberate about thinking about how to make sure that there is um, shared prosperity and that the, the benefits of um, development and of nature um, are, are shared widely um, across society. Um, and I think in, in NatCap's history, like one of, our, one of the first key challenges um, that, that we faced was how can we map and quantify um, the, the values of nature? And that's, um, you know, with our software tools and our approaches, we've come a long way um, and being able to do that for a, a number of benefits. And then more recent innovation, I think, for us has been uh, being deliberate about tracking who those streams of benefits flow to and um, who is providing and who, is, who are the stewards of those benefits um, in different situations. And I think we're starting to see, too, that that's a key piece of designing these policy um, and finance mechanisms, as well as we learn from, from Costa Rica and many other places. Um, I guess just to, to give a couple of quick examples of this, um, one of the places where, where we worked, where I worked, was um, in the Peruvian Amazon. Um, and there's, there's um, like in many places, there's a proposed road that would uh, go through what is now mostly intact forest. Um, and a lot of potential benefits that could come from this road in terms of connecting people to markets and schools and um, healthcare and other services. But uh, we've also seen in many places, and the Amazon is a classic example of a fishbone patterns of deforestation, that when a road gets built, um, it's not only the forest under the land under the road that's affected, but that the effects spread outward from there. And there could be large amounts of deforestation as um, areas are logged or converted to agriculture. Um, so one of the key questions in the case of this road is what are the, you know, I think typically some of the benefits, like the economic benefits, are accounted for, but less the environmental impacts and how those impacts link to um, people and the, the ecosystem service benefits in the area. So using our software tools, we were able to look at the impacts of the road and of likely patterns of deforestation to understand what that road might mean um, for communities in the area in terms of um, climate regulation services, which were actually global, and then in terms of water quality for communities there, many of whom rely on surface water for their drinking water. Um, and we could specifically look, given that we knew where different communities were, um, how the impacts differed between indigenous and um, non-indigenous communities as well. Um, and having, having those maps and having that quantification um, understand what mitigation options were and even whether um, that information became part of the discussion about whether that road even um, made sense or was a good sort of deal um, in, that, in that area by being able to parse that out. Um, and this is also an issue even closer to home, um, for, for me at least in the San Francisco Bay Area where uh, we're dealing with sea level rise and trying to build coastal resilience. Um, and the, the different agencies and counties there 
um, want to invest in green infrastructure um, along the coast to protect not just the high property value homes and um, high value infrastructure, but the many, there are poor and vulnerable communities who are often actually the most vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise. Um, and so it turns out in this case that um, green infrastructure approaches are, are really cost effective approaches in this case um, and making sure that they're implemented in a way that um, again provides those inclusive people living in the area. That's just a few examples, but. Yeah, please, Alvaro, I'm sure you have. Maybe more one to example add. of how the banks have changed. Um, in 1989, I was in a meeting in Tokyo with the president of the World Bank in the same panel, and I criticized the bank because they had financed a hydroelectric project in Costa Rica, uh, and uh, they had invested absolutely zero on the natural infrastructure. Uh, that is, they finance the, you know, the dam and the turbines, uh, but not the watershed. Uh, and uh, he said to me, well, we made a study and, you know, with five million dollars more, we could have bought most of the watershed. But it was the Costa Rican government that said no. And the Costa Rican government kept saying, well, the World Bank wouldn't give us the money. Uh, the reality is that today, the watershed is considered a critical part of any hydroelectric project. Uh, I've also, as part of the inspection panel in, in Brazil, worked in Rondonia, you know, where you, you see this problem of the road penetration, and this is happening today. And because there's lack of certainty about land tenure, uh, people immediately deforest, you know, and now plant soybeans. Uh, so the, uh, the, the role of indigenous people and local people uh, who want to maintain the forest is critical. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, being able to provide them with some income uh, is, is also critical because uh, they, they have very little income and even a small amount may make a big difference. And for example, there are many opportunities for women to, to uh, breed seedlings for trees because you can do that near the home and it provides an additional cash income. So if you create a market for seedlings uh, that can be supplied by the local households, that, that's a way to, to, to get to inclusive green growth. Yeah, great, thank you. And Gretchen, how about you? How would you answer this uh, one? Well, I'll round out with one more thing. I, picking up off of your comments, we spent yesterday at the World Bank and certainly growing up and going through grad school and everything, I heard that that bank was the source of all problems. But um, then I got to meet Carter Brandon over there and um, could see the many forces of good inside it and um, yeah we <clears throat> we have an opportunity right now in the evolution of this movement to drive into um, the I don't know pretty deep parts of the practice of major um, at least these public you know development banks working more on the public good we're going to need at some point to get into the private sector much more deeply than I'd say the movement is now. But in the World Bank, um, it's pretty inspiring. There's high level support for development of this natural capital index that Mary referenced that would potentially really change the conversation um, <clears throat> as the, the bank meets with country governments and looks at options for achieving development. So the index itself will use sort of the same universal language and science methodology for um, quantifying values associated with nature. Look at each country's um, endowment of natural assets and the stream of, of benefits or value that flow from those assets depending on how they're managed. And it'll look for the economists in the room sort of at a production possibility frontier, basically how well a country is deploying its endowment to achieve human development objectives. And um, 
it'll also open up a view to pathways to doing better. You know, how given wherever a country is today in its development path and however well or poorly it's stewarded natural assets, the analysis will reveal pathways for um, improving human well-being and condition at the same time as securing and improving the well-being, the condition of nature. So that's the idea. And um, we're hoping, we, like as we open up in conversation, there are a lot of directions in which we could head, but a key one is you know, where to, where to kind of head next. How do we um, transform rapidly? We don't have a lot of time here. How can we drive and accelerate the transformation, especially of financial institutions and systems to account for nature in all we're doing? Yeah, OK, great. That was a really nice wrap up. So we're going to now transition to hearing from you. So we'd love to hear any questions or comments that you have. And I think there are going to be a couple of mics passed around. So just raise your hand. Oh, here's one here. Great. And we'll just keep moving around. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Melnick. I work for USAID in the Asia Bureau. Thank you so much. And I, too, was a student in the early 90s, 1989. I started my PhD and, and worked on the economic and nutritional value of forest foods in the Venezuelan, uh, southern Venezuela. So, so I followed all of you. Um, quite closely. Thank you. Um, I just had a, a question. Essentially, it is perhaps a question of, of integration and or scalability. On, on the, the work that Stanford has been doing with the, the government of China, are you seeing them picking up any of the, the principles and, and taking them forth on their Belt Road Initiative, which is now not just in Asia, but uh, around the world? And, and similarly, with the World Bank, kudos to the World Bank for the extraordinary analytical capabilities and analyses that it has done over the years. And, and the news is, is great if, if they can promote the GEP and the Natural Capital Index. Yet to what extent do you see that they have a process in place to integrate those analytical work into their day-to-day -day business of banking? And does that make them less competitive when they have like the Asia, infra Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank out there? So I think that's going to be very interesting. So I appreciate your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of interesting times. I'll start an answer. Alvaro, you should continue. And then maybe Carter next to you might answer more fully on the World Bank, given that he's um, much more deeply connected there. You should explain, Carter. But yeah, your point on the China's Belt and Road Initiative is crucial. There's, um, as everybody I bet is aware, um, major plans for financing infrastructure and other development across the world in just about any country at this point that are being um, quite visibly announced by Xi Jinping and others in China, whereas other Countries are busily doing similar things, but not making um, such strong geopolitical statements <clears throat> through it uh, so visibly. Uh, so there's a tremendous opportunity for China, on the one hand, to um, help um, elevate standards for infrastructure investment, for evaluating which investments would achieve a green inclusive growth, for example, pathway or, um, or not. And whether they really follow that um, is completely open, I would say. Uh, we've engaged in capacity building within Belt and Road Initiative, receiving countries um, to enable the kinds of um, both assessments that China has done of ecosystem condition and values, and also policies uh, like China deploys, like zoning land to protect. They've got 49% of the land zoned in priority areas for securing natural capital. And a lot of policies, like I mentioned, incentivizing and enabling economically and otherwise restoration of ecosystems. 
but whether any of this um, helps depends crucially on leadership in China to um, agree to and help negotiate this elevation of standards. And I know the Hank Paulson and the Paulson Institute are quite heavily involved in trying to advance principles for doing so. But all of this is to be seen. And, and guidance, if you have special connection here, would be really appreciated. Alvaro. Yes. Well, no countries are without contradictions. And big countries have big contradictions. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, China was able to implement this hillside payment system very quickly uh, because they have a major problem with migration from, from the countryside to the cities. Uh, so this, this was a, a simple idea that you could get economic and ecological benefits uh, out of it. Uh, now, the other issue is that China is also in the process of a huge global expansion. China dwarfs the World Bank on the amount of projects that they're financing all over the world. And the standards for these projects are not what one would expect. Uh, I speak from Costa Rican experience where, uh, for example, they are financing a road, but when they finance a project, they already choose the company that is going to do it. And in our system uh, of government, we have a public bidding process that we have to go through. So in order to build this project, they had to pass a special law allowing this company to, you know, to build the project. And, and they are a company that has been sanctioned by the World Bank for not having such a great record. Uh, now, how China controls all this overseas effort, it, you know, that it's in the hundreds of billions of dollars per year, it, it's very complicated. But I think it's something that they have to tackle because otherwise the, the standards uh, will not be met and there will be many, many ecological disasters down the road. Carter, did you want to elaborate on the World Bank? Uh, my name's Carter Brandon. I left the World Bank last January, now senior fellow at World uh, Resources Institute. But thanks for your question, and also thanks very much for acknowledging the analytical work, which we obviously take very seriously. But let me just start. The World Bank has 25 years of do-no-harm policies we call safeguards, and they're not bad. They don't use economics. They don't use valuation or NADCAP, but they were basically do-no-harm. So we upgraded that to the environment social framework about a year ago, and we don't want to compete with the Asian Infrastructure Bank, but what the philosophy is of this new framework is not, not only and not even most importantly to apply it to World Bank projects, but to mainstream it in government so that they adopt this international standard of, wood, of what good environmental and social compliance might be. So this framework rollout is a massive, you know, 150 country capacity building effort so that, um, uh, you know, Tanzania or Bangladesh would adopt sort of international standard environmental uh, due diligence. China, by the way, has actually pretty good environmental due diligence, so I don't think they're a focus of this kind of work. But on the analytical side, just to step up from the project level to the country level, World Bank has a periodic process every three, four years with, you know, uh, with the new governments, essentially four or five years, to do a diagnostic of the main problems, which are what are the problems with poverty alleviation, and then what are the problems with sustainability. And we can come up with very good reasons, and we increasingly use natural capital. We do a lot of benchmarking. We compare, I'm, I can tell you, comparing Colombia with Mexico made Colombia very embarrassed, and they borrowed over a billion dollars for green growth. Comparing Laos with Vietnam made Laos very embarrassed about forestry, and they borrowed $100 million for, for green growth. So it really works to do that kind of analysis. But ultimately, it depends on what the countries want to borrow for. The World Bank cannot tell 
a highly degraded country that they should borrow for something. It has, it's demand driven. So, and then the last thing I just want to say, I think the World Bank's using climate change, doing pretty well at looking across countries and convening. And I was very happy to go, go to a meeting three days ago now on Saturday during the annual meetings, a, a new coalition called the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action. And when I say it was a serious event, the president of the World Bank was there, the new managing director of the IMF was there, the secretary general of the UN was there, um, the head of OECD was there, and 50 finance ministers. And not only is it to take climate change seriously in the financial world, it's to, um, they also recognize that the fundamentals of resilience is nature. So this was an opportunity to take this discussion to finance ministers in a way that frankly I hadn't seen before, and this is all in the last six months. So that's promising as well. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Others? In the way back? Hey, um, thank you. Thank you all for your time. Um, so I'm really interested in the notion of G, uh, GEP that you, that you all mentioned about, because I think right now my biggest sort of existential question is like, how do we reconcile our major index for success, right? This thing that's predicated, GDP, which is predicated on consumption. So, you know, for all of our retirement monies like to, to keep growing, like we want people to be consuming more and more. And so I think when I step back, I struggle to reconcile with the fact that like we live in a finite planet. And so I'm wondering how you all think about reconciling that and is it through uh, GEP, like perhaps putting, trying to get governments to have GEP as an index of success alongside GDP? Is it a, uh, something else entirely? I, I'm just curious how you all think about that paradox, if it's a paradox. Well, it sure is. I'll give a quick response and we can have everybody chime in here. Um, I would say, number one, all countries need something like GEP, this kind of tracking of the performance of ecosystems. Um, no question about that in order to achieve anything we might call sustainability. And uh, GEP is a tremendous innovation and step in that direction. At the same time, I'd say it's not the only thing we need in order to achieve the transformation we can fantasize about. There are many other realms in which we need deep change culturally and otherwise, but by um, <clears throat> taking this step, I feel we could go pretty far in um, moving along a pathway that at least allows people to recognize that it's not the economy you know, versus the environment, which is where we still are tragically in so many places. So, this is a crucial moment and opportunity, and um, I feel very inspired while at the same time being tremendously worried about where we are overall. Yes, uh, GDP was one of the things that made me study economics. And I came across a guy named Kenneth Boulding, who was a very smart guy, and, and a president of the American uh, Society for the Advancement of Science at some point. And he, he used to point out to all the inherent contradictions in GDP. Because in GDP, everything adds up. Okay? And he said, well, no, there should be something he called defensive expenditures, which has nothing to do with defense in the sense we use it normally, but it's pollution. Okay? Uh, if the economy pollutes, uh, the pollution control should be, re you know, sh should be subtracted from GDP, not added to GDP. So in, in, in GDP, everything adds up, even all the bad things. Uh, and we, we need, therefore, a better measure. Uh, so many countries have tried to measure the value of natural capital, you know, water and... and, and uh, uh, forest, carbon, etc. Uh, but but there are all the other even more fundamental flaws, which is like, the, you know how much is the value of household work in GDP? Zero. Okay, and 
all of us now do household work and we know it's not worth zero. <laughs> you know, so uh, there, there are, and there's a beautiful uh, passage by Robert Kennedy of, you know, uh, about GDP and it, it measures all the wrong things and it, it doesn't measure any of the right things. Uh, like the strength of the families and the strength of the country and the state of the environment. And uh, so we do need to, to develop uh, alternatives. But, you know, if you ask the economists, they will tell you, well, yeah, we, we agree with all the criticism, but we need GDP for, co for comparison purposes. Uh, well, maybe, you know, we also need to compare GEP. Uh, and, and have all the countries be calculating this, because this is the sad thing. You can extinguish your fisheries, destroy your forest, mine all the gold and oil, and your GDP will rise tremendously. But what it doesn't measure is that the future is absolutely worthless. Uh, so it, it's, a measure, it, it's a measure that we need to improve a lot and, and really know what it does and what it doesn't do. Another comment or question oh, here? And then there's one here in the front, too, after. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Helen Santiago Fink. I'm a climate urbanist and a researcher here in the DC area. I was curious to follow up on your initial um, exp um, example. Did that road get built in Peru or not? Because this is the challenge that we have, is we've been talking about green infrastructure for a long time. Um, since the Clean Water Act here, I mean, so many cities in the US have adopted it. But it's still far from being mainstream. And what's needed when we're looking at, at a local level, at a county level, at a state level, the capital improvement projects and the investment uh, infrastructure investments, we need that value in terms of what are those ecosystem services that are going to be lost or they're going to be added. And my question is, how do we move natural capital and things like nature-based solutions to become mainstream? How do we get that quantification into planning budgets and into uh, CIP budgets? And you spoke about software. Is that software available for everybody? And what can be done to actually really move to scale? Yeah, so thank you for that question. In the case of the Pucallpa, proposed Pucallpa Road, it, it has not been built. Um, you know, I, can't, I can't say that it's like our analysis was the, the sole thing that changed the decision, but I think it was, yeah, the, the environmental impacts of that proposed road were definitely part of um, the, the conversation around whether to move forward with that. Um, to get the question about the software, the Natural Capital Project software, it's called Invest, and it is, um, it's free and open source, um, and you can go to the website um, and download it. Um, it, involves, you, it requires some GIS expertise, although we're always working to make it even easier um, to use, and working with um, sort of a network of people to build capacity in different places so that even, um, you know, if there's information that somebody wants from the software but they're not, the one to run it themselves, that we can help make those um, connections. Um, in terms of how to, how to mainstream, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and we've done some work with, with a number of development banks to, to um, provide information that can be integrated into cost-benefit analyses for um, green infrastructure-based approaches and, and other approaches. Um, did you want to yeah, I think this is an excellent question, and it's partly what we would love your good thinking on. What our approach has been to do demonstrations, because you need not only the easy-to-use tools, but also the pull, the demand from people in mm -hmm. agencies at all levels to say, I want this, I need this, and, and they're even thinking about it. And so this capacity building and training um, program that we have is is geared in part to do that. We've worked a lot with U.S. Um, government leaders at all levels, but we, we are really still trying to figure out how can we get beyond the demonstration scale and help sc spread the good ideas. We have the tools, but it's really the creating the demand in the public sector and private sector. It is growing, as our panel members have said, and one place I see lots of bright spots is in coastal climate resilience, mm -hmm. um, just because, as many of you know, we're 
We're all feeling the increased frequency and intensity of hurricanes, and we're feeling sea level rise. It's bubbling up through sewage systems in, in downtown Miami, so it's, an, it's becoming a nonpartisan issue. People see it and feel it much more every day, from fires to sea level rise. So we're, we're feeling that that is starting to become a louder drumbeat, and we're actually hearing a lot more demand from both the private sector businesses whose physical plants are being threatened by flooding or salt water intrusion into their water systems. Insurance industry sees it and feels it every day, as well as government. So um, it's starting in some sectors and in some arenas, but I think you're pointing to a really big sort of next big challenge is how do we do this scaling and mainstreaming in fast enough in order to get in front of some of these issues. Yeah, it's a big one. So maybe one more here and then we'll, uh, here, yeah. Thank you for being here. My name is Matthew Jelasek. I'm the Senior Infrastructure Policy Advisor at USAID. Hi, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is, I'm gonna throw out some numbers. Uh, Three billion people will live in slums by 2050. That'll be a third of the population of the planet, human population, and more people living in slums globally than will live on the entire continent of Africa. It's a lot of people living in slums. How do we get them access to ecosystems? How, how, do, how do we integrate what is typically a very rural or wild mm -hmm. idea into the densest, most awful places on the planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we're all looking at each other. <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to go for the mental health too. You guys should take this. Le Gretchen and Lisa have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I could say um, we know of like inspiring nascent efforts, but they're really at um, an early stage. One of them is led by um, a consortium. Most of these things require teamwork across the planet to be effective. So it's led in the Stanford arena by a professor named Steve Luby, who made much of his career in Bangladesh and recently moved to Stanford and he's spent his life working on um, issues of water quality and diarrheal disease in developing countries, especially in these types of slum conditions. Um, and the project is designed to um, give the kind of evidence in a suite of slums across Southeast Asia primarily that would be needed to inform uh, replicated kind of investments across um, such situations. Um, so it's meant to provide um, much improved hygiene and access to water through investments in nature in part in, in these places and uh, would then motivate ideally if it all plays out and it's going to take some years. They're just now making the They've designed the investments with a lot of um, involvement. All, all of this work to be effective requires deep involvement with the communities, you know, who are meant to be benefited. So there's, there's a long process there of at least often two years in just engaging and really understanding what the problems are from a, an individual and a household and community level and then kind of bringing in the latest and greatest um, thinking and practice on addressing such problems. And Lisa, you might remember all of the elements better. There's, there's a suite of elements, and it, it, it cover a, a range of things, including um, not only kind of intestinal uh, path in it, pathogens and water quality, but also other types of um, disease risk in those areas and so there's with the package of green infrastructure investment would presumably come a lot of different benefits and the idea is to maximize sort of the co-benefits that would come along 
under the umbrella of trying to improve water quality and sanitation. But did I miss anything major there? No, that's, that's just, so I, I think that's emblematic of the stage of this work. Long way to go, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I think that there is no, no slum, no matter how poor it is, where you cannot improve conditions. And it, it, it's all based on water. Uh, because water is, is, is the main vector of disease you know, uh, throughout the world. So uh, you do have to, to provide some potable water to these communities. But, but more important, you also have to work on, on the sewage system and, and you know, separating the waste. The urine does not pose any sanitary problem. It's the feces. So you have to get people organized, you know, so that they, you can have latrines uh, and, and you can remove the, you know, the, the compost from the latrines. But you do have a work, you need a working system that is twofold. That one focuses on providing clean water so, so that people don't get sick, and the other one on taking away the waste so that they don't get sick with the waste because one of the main problems, as you know, is hand washing. And, you know, when people don't have a lot of water, don't have soap, uh, it's easy to, to do that. But even in, in, in the worst slums, you, you can figure out a system of providing potable water, uh, mostly by trucks in, in, in many cases or uh, you know, by wells uh, in, in other cases. Uh, and also working on the solid waste so that you, know, that, that you take it away and you don't get rat infestation and cockroaches and all that, and the, the sewage. Uh, it's not pretty, uh, but, but it can make a huge improvement. Uh, you know, just having channels where the sewage flows open, the using wetlands for some, to get some degree of treatment. Uh, so th there, are, there are a lot of things that, that can be done on the ground to, to improve people's condition. They require organization, and they require a little bit of money. Yes, uh -huh. here's another up here. Right next to him, yeah, thank you. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, what is being done to try and get some transparency to the situation by having meetings and presenting the material online so people can see it? Well, we're doing a lot, or trying to. We, we need to do more, certainly. But um, we designed the software to be usable in all countries. So number one, the, the science that we're developing is tuned to inclusive sort of uptake worldwide. The purpose of the software, it sounds at one level maybe like a Silicon Valley kind of thing, but it's actually um, the whole idea is to open access to science that otherwise is basically unavailable to no one in my family would know how to read any of these papers, just like none of us can read 99.9% .9 of what comes out in the scientific literature. So. All of it has been designed to be relevant and accessible in all parts of the world, whatever the data limitations in those places, um, planet-wide. And then, yeah, the um, Lisa, do you want to say more on, on the book and distribution and trainings that we do and sure. uh, other ways in which we're engaging now to expand? But um, a key is for sure that we need to go a lot further. I could mention something on Stanford's role in that if it makes sense, but. Sure, I guess I can give a, a few more mm -hmm. examples of how we're, we're trying to get this information and these approaches out in an open way. Um, we have a, a free um, online short course um, that also you can access through the website, um, and there'll be a new version of that as well, I think, shortly. Um, yeah, we do, as I mentioned before, um, lead trainings and workshops around the world and also host um, in the National Capital Symposium annually uh, at Stanford in March. Um, I don't remember the exact dates, but it's on, it's on our website. We, oh, great. And then, um, yeah, also on our website, we have 
both um, databases of examples of, well, of um, natural capital project publications, which includes everything from peer-reviewed literature to um, kind of two pagers and reports aimed at different audiences, and then also a, a database of other people who have used these tools if you're looking for examples in particular places. Did you want to? Yeah, and then uh, a week ago, Stanford announced um, the intention to actually create a new school. The university hasn't had a new school in many decades. Um, so, you know, we've got medicine, law, business, and so on. There will now be a school, I don't, we don't know the name yet, but um, on sustainability and on this kind of stuff. And um, I'm hoping that that will obviously enable the acceleration in um, the research innovation needed to support um, answers to the question on slums, for example, and also um, enable kind of a whole new model, a, a new way of um, deploying the assets in research universities so that we are much more impactful around the world and drive research um, together with people who know the problems deeply that we need to be solving on a scale that we've never managed before in, in history. So it's, it's a pretty momentous time, not just at Stanford, there are many other schools recognizing the importance of sort of centers of excellence in research and places of training, future <laughs> leaders in wide array of arenas and um, trying to rethink how the university, you know, today designed on a model created in Germany a, a couple hundred years ago, how, how universities need to evolve to meet the challenges of the 21st century in time. Any last comments or questions? Yes, here. Um, in doing my graduate work, I became an expert in invest. And so um, my question to you is, I found talking with a lot of my colleagues that the, much of the data that would be important to use in a particular project is either not available at all or in the hands of private um, companies and for a price they would probably sell it to you, lease it to you. Uh, but he, even here in this country, um, I think it's Interior is talking about starting to charge for uh, data that is otherwise uh, or has been available publicly. Are you involved or is NatCap involved at all in trying to alleviate some of these problems since your software is so heavily uh, dependent on data? Yeah, do you want to start on that one? Yeah, I'll follow on China. yeah it's great that you're, that you're an invest user. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we have any others in the room, but um, yeah, the, the point about, so the way Invest was designed was that the models can be run anywhere in the world because there are globally available data, but as you probably discovered, depending on the question you want to ask with it, sometimes you want more locally precise data, and sometimes yeah. that's not easy to get. So I, that's a common um, experience, I think. And the, what we have often done in our collaborations is get the best available data with the collaborators with whom we're working. So they're often very willing to share and find data either in file cabinets that they will digitize or the private sector or proprietary data sources that they will either let us use for analysis or they will do the analyses when we train them. So there are workarounds for trying to get the uptake in decisions. And then your last question about the data and how available are they? I, I agree, I've seen that, that's a real problem, is that some of them were public and they're not, or they were more accessible and they're less accessible now as people learn the value of that information and they try to hold on to it. So we're developing, as Gretchen mentioned, many more approaches to getting data that are public, so this remote sensing techniques and other sources where we aren't relying on 
agencies, for example, in the U.S. to provide us with that. So I think it's going to be an ongoing both opportunity as new data sources come online. I mean, you know, the drones and mm -hmm. low elevation aircraft and low elevation satellites and regular satellites. There's an explosion of new information, but keeping abreast of it and able to use it is something that we're working on every day. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. <laughs> yeah, but it's a, it's a really important issue because, as you said, we need information to then be able to try to make sense of it and synthesize it, yeah. But the information we have is good enough to give at least this rudimentary kind of assessment through the Natural Capital Index of all countries. Mm -hmm. we're, so we're hoping as demand increases um, for this kind of analysis that investment will, you know, or, or just the demand will through various pathways open up greater access. One last okay. question from anybody or comment? Otherwise we'll, oh yeah, there's one over here, great. Uh, thank you, my name is Janet Larson. I'm a researcher and writer and a Stanford Earth Systems graduate. Um, thank you all for your presentations and when you were mentioning wanting to gain more traction in the private sector, I was thinking a little bit about how in the absence of um, a carbon tax or a carbon limit, uh, many of the world's major corporations have at least an internal shadow carbon price that they take, yeah. use to take into account in their um, decision making. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you've discussed or written about in your book if there's any kind of parallel that could work with um, ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, our program was, we have a fuel tax, but we don't have any coal in Costa Rica. So the, the, the fuel tax is the equivalent of a carbon tax. Uh, and we've had that since 1995. Uh, and 3.5% out of that tax, which is like 15% or 15 on fuels, goes to pay for ecosystem services directly. Uh, so that, that's a very, very direct link. Uh, that, that tax has represented more than half of the total revenue of the program. The other parts have come from grants from the GEF, from KFW, from we have now a sustainable biodiversity fund. Uh, people uh, pay with credit cards. Uh, that uh, are for reforestation, and it's the most popular credit card in Costa Rica, so we get some income from, from that. So, you know, th there is a, a number of, uh, of ways to put a price on carbon. Uh, putting a price of carbon is critical. Uh, you know, the companies that put a shadow price, uh, that is the price they should be paying but they're not doing it because there is no compelling overall agreement, you know? And that's why it's so important that the U.S. stays within the Paris Accord because unless the U.S., which is the largest economy in the world, says no to, to, to a carbon tax, to carbon pricing, uh, then there's an excuse for everybody else not to do it. Of course, we know that many states, many companies, many towns are, are doing it on their own. But we do need the, you know, the, the big economies to, to support this pricing of carbon. Uh, and that will allow for a market to create you know, for carbon reductions uh, and in agriculture, in forestry, in, in energy efficiency, et cetera. Uh, so we very much need that. Anyone else? Okay, well, great. This has been really great to engage with you all. And if you can, I want to thank you all for coming and for your interest. But also, please join me in thanking our panel members for a really great discussion. Thank you.